Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Virginia State Small Farm Outreach uh, Farmers Market Preparedness Program with Virginia Association of Farmers Markets with Kim Hutchinson and Mary Delicate. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, we're glad to have so many of you all arrive for our workshop. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Very good. My phone gave me another indication that I may have done something wrong. So uh, I'm glad you can still hear me. Well, <clears throat> again, I'm Michael Carter Jr. with Virginia State Small Farm Outreach Program. Uh, and this will be our first of a series of events uh, for farmers market preparedness and readiness. Uh, we do not have the dates for the other workshops yet. I wanted to confer with Kim first. And uh, when we plan these out, we generally plan them out in September, October. Uh, it's kind of tough for me to gauge uh, what my schedules will be like the following year. Um, so when next week or two, we'll have the rest of the schedule out for the uh, rest of the workshops. Uh, they'd be timely. Uh, they'd be very good. We did a series of these back in June and they were very successful. Uh, we look forward to these being as successful. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kim Hutchinson, the Virginia Association of Farmers Market, Market Association. Virginia Farmers Market Association, sorry. And um, okay. Kim, you can go ahead and take the ball from here. Thanks, Michael. And welcome everybody to the 2021 uh, Virginia State University Farmers Market Preparedness Class in partnership with the Virginia Farmers Market Association. I'm Dr. Kim Hutchinson. I'm the Executive Director of the Virginia Farmers Market Association or VACMA as we call it. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the VACMA is a member-based statewide association focused on the sustainability of Virginia's 356 plus farmers markets and 20,000 plus producers and farmers and food processors that work at our markets. As a convener and a collaborator, VACMA brings experts, thought leaders, and passionate individuals together from diverse interest groups to address and support the needs of the state's farmers, farmers markets, vendors, and local food systems. Now more than ever during the difficult and unprecedented times of COVID-19, the Virginia Farmers Market continues to advocate for and strengthen connections between farmers, between farmer markets and local producers in order to help sustainable businesses engage communities and improve the local food system, all while showcasing Virginia's bounty, creating a unique connection between food producers and consumers and building safe community locations to access Virginia grown and produce nutrient dense food. We are in unprecedented times. I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. We need every tool in our toolkit so that we can get to be successful. And I mean, really, can you think of a more challenging time than the past nine months to be a producer of food? I cannot. In all the uncertainty, along with the changing landscape of state and local requirements, literally kept me up at night. And the way that farmers and producers and farmers markets traditionally run was all flipped upside down. Normally, we encourage everyone to bring your whole families out to the community to make it an event, to stick around for a meal at a farmer's market, to dry samples, to shake the hands that feed them, to talk to the producers, to learn about you, your farm, and why they should be buying from local producers versus buying from um, a grocery store. Not this season, or not this past season, or this upcoming season. Nope. The past season, we had to change everything. And what did we do? We adjusted, we pivoted, we moved our markets, we moved everything online in March. We opened earlier, we opened later, we created drive throughs we created hand washing stations, and we bought hand sanitizer. So much hand sanitizer. We dealt with angry people, and we dealt with really angry people. We cleaned, we social distanced, and what was the result of our efforts? We got your food to the people. While big supply chains balked, we changed on a dime and we opened for business because that's what we do. From this season forward, the flexibility of farmers markets and Virginia's farmers and producers is undeniably legendary. During this time, many of you reached out to me and it was a pleasure to talk to you about your concerns of being a producer and your fear for what was going to happen with your family farm and how were you going to be able to survive. We always responded. We answered all your questions. We got clarifications from state officials. 
I persuaded state and local officials to let our markets open. I ran interference between you and your markets and concerned citizens. I hosted webinars after webinars and conference calls and I visited markets across the state and I lobbied legislators hard all on behalf of you and your ability to be able to sell your products. During the past nine months, you also likely read COVID-19 updates that came out through our website, which we established on the fly during this pandemic. It showcased webinars, social media, and many newsletters that had up-to-date information on what you needed to do to be a producer, to have a farm stand, to sell at a farmer's market in order to keep your product getting to the community. And I have to thank Mary Delicate, our marketing pro and our chief technology tamer for all of the help that she did. She's in the background writing content, creating graphics, prepping speakers and getting all of the information out to you in a timely and appropriate manner. We did our all of this on behalf of you and the farmer's market because this is what we do. We love Virginia's farmer's market and we are completely in this with you. We're all stretched thin and 2021 is going to be just as tough with COVID-19 raging throughout the state. I'm now pleased to say that we've been able to get you deemed essential through the farmer's market and get you on the early vaccine list for 1B. But we've seen code raging across the state and it's happening across the nation. We've seen other states shut their markets down. We've seen farms close. We've seen producers go out of business across the country and many more are balancing on the brink. It's a tough time, but we are tough and we are resilient. In 2020, producers did well. Many sold more than ever before. Farmers markets from across the state wrote to me. Farms that I talked to starting in March wrote to me and said, thank you for helping me get my product to the people in the community. We were fearful we were gonna lose our farm and we did not. You all held tough and you brought the food and with your energy and commitment to continue to serve the communities with locally grown and produced food, I look forward to working with you in 2021. This webinar and the series that follows is going to give you the tools if you're interested in going to a farmer's market and getting your products online. You're going to learn about food safety and the requirements that are required by the state in order to sell a product to the consumers. You're going to have, we're going to do a session on online platforms, which will teach you everything from data management, what kind of data you need to collect, to controlling your inventory, to selling your products online, whether it's at a farm store, whether it is at a farm stand, or whether it's at a farmer's market, but how to sell your product. And then we're also going to teach you how to market and do social media in the 21st century, because that's ever evolving. And we found during COVID, now more than ever, you've got to know how to market your business. So I'm excited to be able to bring today's session to you, which is how to get your market open. I have asked several of our um, uh, friends of our organization to share with you today. And this is a two-way street. They're going to give you lots of information, both from a farmer's market side, as well as the producer side on what you need to know about um, being prepared to take your market to sell. And um, they ask you to please feel free to ask questions. Now is the time. We've got a group of very successful people here that I'll be sharing with you. And they're open to whatever questions and resources that you need. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tracy Fry. Tracy is the market manager of the Williamsburg Farmers Market. The Williamsburg Farmers Market is one of the top 10 farmers markets in the country. And a lot of that has to do with Tracy and how she builds the relationships with her producers, the farmers, and how she builds these collaborative mm -hmm. relationships and working with not only the farms and producers, but also the community. Tracy has um, asked several of her producers to join us here today also to talk about their experience in selling using online platforms, selling at a farmer's market, um, just being a producer in general as somebody that sells their product through retail and what you need to do. To know. So Tracy is going to chat with us about um, being a market manager and what you need to know if you're interested in going to a farmer's market and being in a farmer's market in that process. And we're also gonna hear from Elizabeth Haas with Hash Room, 
with Dora Beltram with Norma's Produce and Penn Farm, with Catherine Warren with State Farm Ke State Fair Kettle Corn, Maureen Anderson with Tasha Zone, and Ainsley Martin with the Virginia Bread Company. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Fry. Tracy, do you need to share screen? I do, please, yes. How do I do that? Let's see. Um, okay, you're a co-host, so you should be able to share screen. Yay, thank you. Uh, I would like to take that prize, but you need to thank Mark. <laughs> I think he's the one that hooked you up. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Tracy, you're in. Um, I can see all the slides and notes. Yeah, sorry. No worries. Perfect. Excellent. So I'm Tracy Fry, and as Kim kindly introduced, I am the market manager of the Williamsburg Farmers Market. I've been a market manager um, since 2013 and been working uh, for the Williamsburg Farmers Market since 2011. Um, I do have a few of my vendors on here with me today, and some of them have expressed that they need to get going sooner. Um, so those uh, vendors, I'm actually going um, to jump in and out of my slideshow to accommodate their schedule because I think what they have to say is really important. Um, so I know Maureen Anderson with Tasha's Own um, does have to leave and so does uh, Elizabeth Haas. Um, so Maureen, let's start with you real quick. How, uh, how about you introduce yourself? Let us know um, what, what your business is like, how long you've been at the market um, and what you sell. Okay, hi, I'm glad to be here. And I just wanna to check to make sure everything's working because this is only the second time I've done this. So uh, am I coming in loud and clear? Yep. Okay, great. Yep. Um, I have been at the Williamsburg Farmers Market for eight years, I believe. Uh, this will be my eighth year. And I um, make and um, produce a, a goat's milk soap uh, with milk from my dairy goats and all the honey comes from my beehives and herbs from my garden. And I have been working with Tracy the whole time. So I've been under really good tutelage. So I'm very, very grateful to have her as a mentor really to guide us through this. Um, what was your next question after I introduced myself? Sure. Um, I think you said that you sell goat's milk soap and you've right. been with us since, the, since you first started. How did you decide that a farmer's market was the right place for you versus other places you could sell soap? Well, um, farmers, I do better. There's really just a, an ocean of products out there, especially goat's milk soap. It seems like right after I started my company, uh, that became the up and coming thing. And so really, in order to stand out in a crowd, I need to be able to speak with my, cons my customers and with the consumers. So really a venue like a farmer's market was really the way to go because I'm able to talk directly to these people. These people actually then go and spread the word about my product um, basically because they've met me. And I think that people in this day and age and really, really especially now want to connect with their producers and with their farmers. Um, I'm also a farmer, so I don't just make soap in my kitchen, you know, with milk that I've bought. I have a very large uh, herd of dairy goats, which is one of the reasons I have to leave early because one is in labor. We just delivered one about two hours ago. And I did have to intervene. So um, I'll be going back out to the barn uh, shortly here. <laughs> um, but I think people wanted to, I think my sales are just based on being able to meet the consumer. And so that's why I wanted to do farmer's market. I did do a, started a small market in Virginia Beach, um, Old Beach Farmer's Market with um, a few other farmers there before I came up to Williamsburg. Um, but I actually left um, someone else attending that market and I would drive up to the Williamsburg market really because I preferred it. And uh, we just saw sales, you know, increase and it became, got to the point where, you know, I was able to make the product that I produce um, 
my main source of income. So I've actually, you know, raised a family of eight kids on, you know, sales from farmers markets. Did you ever apply to a market and get declined? And if you did, um, how'd you pivot? I did actually, I applied to a market that already had two other soap sellers. And so um, one was goat's milk and one was not. And so they didn't want to saturate their market with another product and they were very loyal to theirs. I actually um, got um, denied by the previous um, market manager at Williamsburg Market because they had another soap producer. So um, I was diligent. So my advice would be to stick with it and try again year after year because you don't know what might happen. And um, some farmer's market manager might end up calling you like mine did and say, hey, we have a space for you. Um, also, another way to pivot is to, it really makes you, motivates you to get the word out some other way. Nothing really motivates me really like a no. So I find that when I get told no, whether it's by a store or I go into Whole Foods, let's say, or some other store and ask if they'd like to carry my soap, when I get turned down, it just makes me step up my game a little bit more. So I end up um, doing marketing more, talking more, um, going online and finding other uh, ideas. So that's really what I would say is it makes me get out there more. That's what I did. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, as, as a, um, I don't think you mentioned that you actually recently started a little farmer's market here in the general area in Toano, um, but as a, another market manager, um, what is something you wish people knew, which wish potential vendors knew about the work that you do as a market manager? Wow. Oh boy. Oh, that, in that's like a, one sentence. <laughs> yeah, in one sentence. Um, I wish they knew how helpful it would be to give us more information about their product and their farm so that we could put it out there without having to create it. I find myself playing Sherlock Holmes or Nancy Drew or whoever. I'm digging, digging, digging and like gathering pictures from different areas and creating um, I figured that I spent between seven and eight hours per week marketing my little market out here on the other end of uh, James City County, the, the uh, northern end, um, just on my own. And, you know, that's that's tough. That's tough uh, to do and to take that away. And I would end up saying, whoops, I forgot to talk about Tasha's own goat's milk soap in there. So that's what I would say. And that's not one sentence. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's fine. I think it's good and helpful information. That's the truth. Um, and yeah. I know you have uh, you have baby goats to deliver, so I'm not going to keep you any longer. Thank you well, so much. Marianne. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And I'll probably pop back on just to listen to what you've got to say when I'm done out there. All right. So if you guys have any questions, you can pop them in the chat. And Maureen's really good at texting, so I can text her those questions too. Um, yeah. But that way we're not keeping her, so her baby goat yeah. is fine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, you're welcome. Bye, Maureen. The Bye. next vendor um, that has to run is Elizabeth Haas with Haas Mushrooms. Are you there still, Elizabeth? I, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you don't mind, if you could just introduce yourself and let us know a little bit about you and your business and how long you've been um, in business. Okay, my name is Elizabeth Haas, and I am the co-owner of Haas Mushrooms with my husband, Steve Haas, and we have been in business since 2010. Um, we are growers. We're mushroom growers, but I think early on, my husband, who is very cutting edge, uh, decided that we needed to also have value-added products in an effort to stay abreast of what was coming and and it did and so we created we sunk a lot of money into having an e-commerce page and when um this year hit and things were different and we did all have to pivot um and i have had help along the way mary delicate won in the beginning with fall on farms and then tracy all along the way still to this day helps me with technical stuff um but so we're growers and we also have value-added products and i also agree with maureen and that i think it's important for 
not just the growers, but, but all vendors to be able to connect with their customer. Us in particular, because we, um, there's so many different mushrooms that we grow and they all have different medicinal values, um, properties. And so, yeah, um, we, we, our e-commerce page has taken off within one week of COVID hitting and the farmer's market shutting down. Tracy had a hub up and running, which is amazing to me. Um, and our sales on Fall Line Farms and some of the other hubs have taken off right now. Um, today is a delivery day, so that's that's where I've been. I'm just um, I'm in my car, and that's why you can't see me. Um, but I'm now on three hubs and two full-time markets, and then my seasonal market with Williamsburg, um, which is my personal, you know, favorite. Um, and so we, we did, we pivoted and, and our online sales are through the roof and I have to go home or the, the orders just come in and we have dry goods. And I think that's why my husband was, husband was so smart because you can't ship fresh mushrooms. I mean, you can, but it's, it's, there's a lot to it. And, um, yeah, that's so all I know right now. Um, sorry to interrupt you. How did you, or how do you, um, how did you decide to start selling at farmer's markets? And then one more question, cause you attend multiple markets. The other uh, thing that maybe people are curious about is how do you saw, decide which market to invest your time in and which markets um, do you choose not to participate in? Well, I tell you, we, we are not, we, well, first of all, we started, um, Steve started this, his dream was always to be a market gardener. And, um, I jumped on the bandwagon in, uh, 2012. He started in 2010. And as the business grew, um, He's also a wild mushroom expert, so there was that too. Um, I'm sorry, Tracy, I forgot the other question. So, how do you decide which markets to attend? Oh, well, you know, we. What are you looking for? We try everything. We're mm -hmm. what, what we're looking for is, um, you know, necessarily the big, uh, not necessarily the smaller markets. We want, we are kind of of the mindset: go big or go home. And, um, but we do do some small markets and, you know, especially during these times, people want fresh food. They want, um, good, clean food that is immune boosting. And, um, that's who we are. That's awesome. And, um, did you ever apply to a market and get declined? And if so, how'd you pivot Well, yes, we did, and we're not going to stop trying. Um, we applied to the Charlottesville market, and they have a mushroom vendor. And my husband, I don't know if any of you know him, he, he, his, the way he says it is, he is the mushroom vendor. So, um, and I know that a lot of markets don't like to saturate. And, and to be truthful, um, we are a specialty product. We're... Um, you know, kind of like you don't want to have too many goat soaps, too many mushroom vendors, too many pasta vendors, um, or too many fermented food vendors. So uh, we we haven't given up on Charlottesville. We're going to try again, but but also I understand um, why they wouldn't want to saturate the market. My husband's a different story. <laughs> is there anything That's else? That's who he is. Uh, is there anything else you would want to give as advice to somebody looking to um, participate in farmers markets? I know you and I, we talk a lot about um, showing up. So maybe you can tell us your philosophy on that. Well, that's exactly what I was going to share. And, you know, looking back, um, Steve and I, at every single one of our markets, have a hundred percent attendance um, to a fault, to a fault where we haven't had a vacation in seven years. 
Um, but we're not spring chickens. We are in our mid and late fifties and we are trying to build a brand. We're trying to build a business and we're trying to leave something to our children. Um, so yeah, we started this thing. Steve was 50 and I was in my mid forties and, um, yeah, we, we just, we get up and we show up every day, every day we get up and we show up. Um, and now thank God, neither one of us have ever been sick on a Saturday. So we are able to get up and show up, but I, I, that for me, that's the most important. Just don't stop. Um, There's, just gotta, um, and, yeah, I'm sorry. There, I, I was just going to ask <laughs> one more follow-up question to that. Um, because one of the thing, one of the reasons I invited you on this, other than the fact that you're a grower who also does value added, um, you actually served as our vendor representative on our board of directors, um, which every, every couple of years we select a vendor and invite them to participate as a, as the representative on our board. Um, so I was wondering if maybe through your last couple of years as being that board representative, um, you might have some insight as to something you think most vendors would have no idea happens behind the scenes that you learned as being part of our board of directors. Oh, yeah. Um, let me tell you, these market managers, the people behind the scenes, you know, I know it takes farmers to make a farmer's market but it really does take more than and than just us growers or producers to make these farmers markets. the work they do is unbelievable I mean you know I honestly sometimes wonder how they do it and how like Tracy for example the way you pivoted Tracy and had us on an online platform within one week or I think it was really five days is really nothing to sneeze at because there were so many products to add to this uh, platform. There were so many vendors and there was so much educating um, our managers has, have to do to get us up and running because we're outside. We're busy growing. We're busy indoors making our products and um, labeling and packaging. And, and it just, it really does. It, it really does take a, a, whole village of us to to make this whole thing happen and i'm so grateful um for the different platforms that we participate in for all of you like kim and mary and uh tracy who do the behind the scene work uh the work y'all do is just um uh thank you it's a <laughs> lot it's I, I can't even describe it because i don't even know what half of it is because you do it for us you know that's awesome. Thank you so much, Liz. I know you are really busy today with Fall Line Farms and I appreciate your time. Uh, Liz is also one of those amazing people who does check her uh, text messages and stuff. So if she does have to leave, but you have any follow-up questions, um, you can put them in the chat and I will make sure um, that she either hops back on or just responds and lets me know the answer to any of those questions. We'll also provide contact information uh, for the speakers um, to, to Kim and uh, whoever else is disseminating information after this. Thank, thank you for letting me join you. Yeah, thanks so much, Liz. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, bye-bye. Bye. All right. Dora, are you on the, um, are you on this? I don't know if she's hopped on yet or not. Ainsley, are you on? All right, we'll move through and if they hop on, they can, uh, they'll text me and let me know. Um, so um, hopefully it was nice uh, to hear from some of the actual vendors as to their process. Um, I think one of the things uh, you may have heard, um, there's lots of things people get really excited about going to market. Um, and from my experience, which now is kind of extensive, um, 
there's some things that people should probably do before they even think about where they're going to sell their stuff. Um, so the first thing you really want to know, um, you want to know strongly what you're selling and you want to know uh, that it's going to be successful sort of before you really invest too much of your time. Um, so my number one advice would be to find your pitch. Uh, whether that's, you know, you're going to sell produce, well, you need to understand that there's, if you want to sell at market, there's going to be a saturation point for tomatoes and bell peppers and um, depending. But if you go for those specialty crops, you might have a little easier way of getting into markets, especially if they already have produce. Or if it's not that it's specialty, maybe it is some way that you're extending your season to make you attractive. Um, second, you wanna make sure that you are uh, doing your research. So before you apply to a farmer's market, you would probably wanna visit the market. You wanna um, determine is the market right for you? Maybe you should start with the CSA or you should try an online store, or um, there's lots of ways to figure out what's best for you, but you should really invest the time to make sure um, that farmers markets are gonna be the best option for you. And then third, you wanna make sure you're setting up your business. And those aren't always in order. Sometimes life happens and you might need to mix those up. Um, but before you apply, you wanna make sure that those three things are done. And what I mean by setting up your business, you wanna make sure that you have liability insurance, that you have a bank account, that maybe you have a budget, you figure out what your staff expenses are gonna be, you know how much you should charge for your produce or whatever it is that you're gonna sell so that you are within the profit margins that make sense for your business. You can also work with a business coach. There's um, lots of people out there looking to help um, that would include like in the Williamsburg area, it's SCORE. And even as a market manager, every now and then we reach out to them to make sure that our business um, is running as efficiently um, and effectively as it can be. Um, so even if you have your business set up, if it's not set up for a farmer's market, you may need to go back through, do the research and make sure it's ready to go. Um, then once you've decided farmer's markets are definitely the way that you wanna move, um, here are some things you wanna consider. Uh, you wanna consider proximity. If you wanna go big or you wanna go home, you also need to think about the time that it takes to go big or go home. Um, at Liz didn't say, but she's actually all the way out in Goochland County, which may or may not be all the way out there for you. Um, but uh, for us, it's about 100 miles. So it's about 100 miles each way from Goochland to Williamsburg, um, which, you know, that's time. Um, and then to Richmond, it's a lot closer to Charlottesville. I mean, it's, it's a little bit further than to Richmond, but not as far as Williamsburg. So proximity is really important because when you're thinking about your costs, time is definitely an expense. And then you got to think about staffing. If it's a bigger market, uh, you may need more than just yourself. If you're selling produce, even if it's a smaller market, you may actually need more people uh, because of the amount of questions that people are probably going to ask you about the things that you're selling. And they want to talk to you, especially if you're a farmer, to say, like, how did you grow this? Did you use pesticides? I am also growing tomatoes, but for some reason they aren't red and, you know, there's just time. Um, and uh, so you need to determine that you have enough people there to set up your tents and make sure um, you have what you need in order to be successful at market. Um, the other thing you need to consider are the fees. Um, some markets charge an application fee. Some markets charge a weekly fee. Some markets charge a percentage like Williamsburg. Um, some markets charge that upfront. So you have to pay for the whole entire season before the season begins. Um, but that's definitely something to consider. You may want to go to a market, but you may realize that they charge their fees upfront and it's 500 bucks for the season and you may or may not have that. 
Um, so just things to think about. And then rules. Uh, every market has a rule. We definitely as market managers put understanding the rules um, and following the rules on the vendor. We also talk about it a lot, but we expect them at least to have been read and sort of understood. Um, and then the requirements to join a market. Um, I get that a lot, especially this time of year. It's really exciting to, um, to apply to be a farmer's market vendor, especially if you've got a new business and you think it's a great idea and you didn't read and you didn't do your research. So you really have no idea what you need, but you just need to be part of a market. Um, so not understanding the requirements is definitely gonna hinder the process and make it take longer. And then understand at a farmer's market, there may be competition and depending on the market that you are trying to um, attend, they may um, be protective of their vendors and not want a huge amount of competition um, or they may encourage competition. And that's why if you do your research and you visit your markets or at least visit their websites, you can find out a little bit about them uh, and it makes the process a little less painful. Um, then there's some information you can get from a really good market manager. Um, so they should be able to tell you something like what an average market looks like, about how many customers roll through, what their annual sales are, um, and that'll help a lot uh, when it determines, you know, how much staff you're going to need or how much produce you're supposed to bring or um, so at least they should be able to tell you in the past that they had a vendor who does what you do and that vendor always seemed happy or something. Um, but that data um, that should be coming from the, the market manager and that should be relatively easy to provide at least some type of, I think, you know, there are at least, I don't know, in our market, we have on average about 400 people um, every 30 minutes. And, you know, um, so that adds up to a, a high volume of customer traffic passing by at any given time. And then there's the application process. So you wanna to come to the market, you sort of need to know what that, that process looks like. And the number one thing I would mention is that most markets require you apply every single year. Just because we have your information doesn't mean that we wanna pull out your information every year. Um, and most market managers, that's one of the most tedious parts of January. Um, and as I'm now at the end of January, I can say that the next time somebody asks me to look in their file, I might get a little grumpy with them. Um, so keep your business information in order. Every place that you apply, make a copy of that application and put it in a folder. And then the next year when you need to apply again, it will be super easy because you'll have all that information ready to go. And then also you may want to put a calendar reminder of when that information is due so that when it's application time, You've already been in touch with your liability insurance agent um, and you're ready to go. If you have any questions about the application process, that's a great time to introduce yourself to a market manager um, and ask them those questions. You never want to ask those questions or ask questions of a market manager in the middle of a market um, because market managers have other things on their minds. Just like a market manager shouldn't be asking you questions during a market because there's an unspoken understanding that the market is where you are there to sell and to make money for yourself. So it's really about respect. And you always wanna send in a complete application um, because otherwise it most likely will not be considered. If I get an incomplete application, it goes into a file of other incomplete applications. I do not look at it unless somebody follows up with me and calls me and asks me about it. And then follow up. So if you haven't heard from a market manager and it's May, maybe it's because they're super busy starting up a farmer's market. Um, you can follow up by email, you can follow up by phone, um, at least to find out what their process is, because every market has a little bit of a different process. 
All right, so you heard me ask the vendors who were on the call with us if they'd ever been declined. It is a very ouchy thing. Uh, it's not fun, but I figured I would mention it because depending on how many markets you want to attend or if you reach out to Williamsburg, although it's my least favorite thing to do, um, I do every year have to decline vendors. Um, so what to do when you've been declined? You'll get a nice letter from us. Uh, we try to tell you it's not personal, but it feels personal to get declined. There's lots of reasons why you may be declined and you can ask, um, but you shouldn't really necessarily argue, but you can totally ask. So um, most markets will, will be happy to tell you why. It could be that you didn't really read our website or our application and you wanna sell arts and crafts and that's not something we do at our market. It could be that you're a food truck and we don't have food trucks at our market. It could be that you want to come and you want to sell tomatoes, but all you have are tomatoes. Yeah, I am not really sure that that would be a very successful business at our market. It might work at some, um, but my, you know, nine years of experience as a market manager may dissuade me um, from feeling like it would be really um, profitable for either of us for you to be at our market. Um, but you can always ask why, and most market managers will tell you and give you time to recoup. One of the vendors who was supposed to be on the call, she wound up having, um, she does some wholesale and live events. I wanted her to be on the call because she is our only vendor, um, well, one of our only vendors that deals with the health department. And she actually applied, I want to say, for three years and was declined. She sells kettle corn. So she's with State Fair Kettle Corn. And the first reason she was declined is because kettle corn is corn. And the corn that she was using was from Iowa. And in our market, we're a little bit stricter than other markets. Um, and so we declined because she didn't use a local corn. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, three years later, not all of a sudden, sorry, of hard research on her end, which she told me an email uh, to include, uh, she found a local and organic grower of the type of corn that she wanted to use for her product here in the state of Virginia. And it changed the answer when she applied. If she hadn't asked why, she would have just heard no. But because she continued following up and we talked about it and we worked together, um, she actually got a better product, an organic corn, um, and you know now she's been, I think she's been with the market six years um, and she's definitely, um, she's definitely one of those customers or, or one of those vendors I really wanted you guys to hear from because perseverance, it takes a lot of that. Like farmer's markets aren't easy, doing this work isn't easy, um, but when you have a success, it's nice to share it. Um, so let's see. And then try again. I think you heard that from the people who mentioned they had been declined. Sometimes it's timing. Um, you never know when somebody's going to close. You, they're going to switch markets or uh, close their business. Um, one thing that's for sure for certain is that vendors at farmers markets are getting older, um, which means that this year it might not be positive next year things may have changed especially with bakers like at our market for the longest time i think for five years straight we did not accept any new bakers into our market we had solid bakers they came every saturday and they were tried and true and successful and they met every niche we could think of and then life happened and their avail availability changed and instead of every week they came every other week and so instead of turning down new bakers, um, we've actually accepted. And I think we accepted a new baker, uh, one at least one new baker every year for the past three years. So you've been accepted, yay. Um, so now you need to think about the putting it together part. And this is also really important. Uh, I get asked a lot, do you guys give us tents and tables? We do not. The number one reason, that I know, I mean, other than, wow, we would really need a big storage unit for our uh, 50 vendors um, if we kept all of those. But also um, several years ago, a market that um, I had been working with or heard of or something, um, 
was offering all of that for vendors and then they had a fire and the fire destroyed all of the tents and tables and you know pretty much decimated their market um, so tents tables you need to look into it do your research again i'm going to push that word um, that's all part of your business you also need to think about displays and signs and clear pricing our market um, and i think quite a few others uh, not every market does annual vendor meetings, but lots of them do. The vendor meeting, we definitely gear it to setting vendors up for success. Yes, we have to talk about rules and regulations. That's my job. I am the rule and regulation kind of person. Um, but mostly we want to make sure you're as successful as possible. So we pick like the top three to five things. We usually have somebody from VSU like Dr. Teresa Nortea. Uh, we definitely reach out to VAFMA and um, VDAX to talk about food safety um, and all of the things like this series is doing, some markets will actually do on top of it just individually for their vendors so that every single one of them hears the exact message we want all of our vendors to have. The number one thing I didn't have on here, but everybody should have, um, weights, uh, the worst thing that a market uh, can possibly um, encounter is lightning and wind. And uh, so lightning, you should, you can usually, and we're a morning market, we really don't have a problem with lightning, but wind is a thing and, um, and you should have weights. And if you think you have enough weights, you should add more weights and you should make sure that even if it's sunny and there's 0% chance of wind, that you have lots of weights. Um, and then signs, clear pricing. If you, um, if you really want to know what will work, you should ask your market manager and they will help you with signs and they will help you with clear pricing. And you should take that free advice um, because they usually have lots of experience at what works in their area. Because like different areas have different things um, and different uh, ways of interacting and the market manager lives usually in that area and so they can help you with some of that um, and then uh, those rules and expectations um, are something that you should definitely know and that you should definitely follow so you're at the market uh, now you need to make sure that you're making the most of your time so don't sit down because uh, you can't sell if you're sitting Unless you have a medical condition or something like that, that means that you have to sit, you should probably stand. You also, um, let's see, should not be on your phone, except for when you're taking payments. Uh, if you are on your phone, uh, people will think that you are busy and they will not walk up to you. Um, and you also should have something enticing and large enough to see from across the market. Uh, there is some psychology of being at a market that they may not be able to tell from the middle of the street what you sell. And if they can't, then they may or they may not come over to where you are, depending on how socially adept they are. And now that we have a whole generation of children that are now growing up to be adults that do a lot of their things on social media, um, that social interaction, it needs to be very clear because they may or may not feel comfortable coming up to you to find out what it is that you're selling and your prices should be the same thing, especially in markets where um, there is a high uh, population of um, like EBT customers and there's uh, lower income demographics and stuff like that. You need to make sure your pricing is clear and that way in addition to making it easier for the customers, it also means you're more likely to make a sale if somebody walks up to you. So it may dis, uh, not encourage people to walk up if they don't have $10 in their hands, but if they walk up to you and they saw that $10 across the street, then that means that they're, accept, that they're accepting that that's an acceptable fee for whatever it is that you're selling. So I highly encourage clear, large, pricing and signage. And then always take a picture of your setup. Um, and then also, if you take a picture of your setup and you have helpers who are coming in your place, make sure that your helpers know exactly what you want your setup to look like. Although I will always say that the owner or the head honcho is always the best person to sell your products because you know the most about it. 
That's not always possible, especially if you are participating in a lot of markets. Um, so make sure that your people are representing you the way that you want to be represented. And the best way for you to make sure that happens is to take a lot of photos and show those people exactly how you want it to be and how you would like your customer experience to be and make sure that they have all the tools that they need to be able to sell your product just like you would. And then evaluate it. Uh, I know very frequently when my um, vendors have new staff that they're training, they will text me, they will let me know that they have new staff, they will ask me if I can just walk by and make sure everything's okay. If, um, you know, when I get around to it in the market, I will definitely do that because success of my vendors, especially since we're a percentage based market, the success of our vendors is my success. And it literally is my bottom line because we are a percentage based market. It is part of our budget. It is definitely my most important, uh, one of my most important tasks is to make sure every single farmer's market is as successful as I can ensure it to be. Um, and so even though there, there are different markets that are set up differently, they should, still should have a very motivated person to make sure you are as successful as you can possibly be. And then don't stay stagnant. I tried to get Amy Hicks with Amy's Garden to join us here today. Because uh, she is uh, my favorite example of somebody who did things the same way for 15 years. And then somehow one day, I don't know exactly what it was that changed her mind, but um, I guess about five years ago, um, she decided to change the way her tables were set up. And instead of having like five really long tables and all of her stuff laid out so that people could just see it, she switched it to like four groupings of tables in a square formation so that people could move in and out as they wanted to and they could view things at different angles and then at the end of it they would just go and pay and it increased her sales by 150 percent which was pretty exciting um, although you know with covid things changed and she did have to revert back to her original way of doing business because she wanted to discourage the touching of produce so you have to be flexible but also know that just because you've been doing something a certain way um, changing it may actually make you more exciting to customers Oof. and that's all i got um so we have a bunch of questions for cool. you all right sorry that's all right do you require all of your vendors to have liability insurance we do Mm -hmm. And that's actually recommended. I know from the national level, they started recommending it, um, but our market has mandated liability insurance um, since 2009. Um, and, sorry, I think part of the reason we require, I, every market really should because the liability is truly mm -hmm. there. Even um, this past year, although we were pretty much um, you know, we, we only operated from June until December of 2020. Um, in November, there was one windy market and I saw at least five tents fly through the parking yeah. lot, even though they were weighted down. I mean, there's just an opportunity for liability to happen. And so most markets require liability insurance and that they also require that the market itself is a certificate holder and listed as an additional insured. And on top of that, we also have an agreement on our application, which I will send a link to, um, which also has like this uh, um, indemnification clause on it saying you will not hold us liable and all the things that our lawyer recommended us to do. So that's the other thing is if you don't have a lawyer, um, that's fine. But when you accept, when you sign that market agreement, it is a legal binding um, document. Mm -hmm. And if you sign something, you should at least read it and understand that what you are signing is, it could actually not necessarily be to your benefit, but you, you will go ahead and do it because you want to be part of a market. But we did have a lawyer look at it and most markets do tend to have some type of legal advice with our documentation. So if you have a lawyer, you may want them to look at your documentation before you sign it. Thank you. I know regarding liability insurance, I talk about it at every producer meeting that I go to. I talk to your vendors about it every year when I, if I come to your meetings. 
Um, for you all as farmers, producers, if you're looking at selling your product at a farmer's market, the farmer's market itself are required to have a liability policy. You're not covered under that policy. If your tent, if you don't have enough weights on your tent and it's windy and your tent gets ripped out of the ground and hits a consumer's car or another vendor and they pursue legal action, you're not covered. You need to um, have your own liability policy. So you need to check with um, insurance agents on that because it protects you legally. Tracy, the next question that we have is, do you require all of your vendors to submit sales tax forms, including farmers? We do, yeah. Um, we, so in fact, we, we used to ask a lot of questions we're not gonna ask anymore um, because we just don't need to know and it adds a little bit of extra math that we don't need to do. Um, but sometimes even market managers do what they've always done because it's easier. <laughs> so I'm gonna take my own advice and say I need to change when, when I determine. Um, sometimes we don't do the, the best things either. So having a good conversation with your market manager, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's really refreshing. Um, but for us, we do require that, that sales and use tax. And on top of that, our city, as we partner with our city very closely, um, our city gets a list of our vendors. So our city does not require us to require our vendors have a business license to do business in the city of Williamsburg. And that is a wonderful accommodation that they made for the farmer's market. Um, but we do require of our vendors and they do then go back through and make sure that sale that the sales tax has come from each of those vendors. Because I think that it's very confusing when you're submitting your sales and use tax. Um, if you're not really careful, you may forget to, um, to select the right location as to where your sales were. And it's easy to imagine that you should submit your sales tax for the location that you live in, but it's literally where the sale occurred as to where you pay the sales tax. And if you have that sales tax form, then that sort of takes it off our to-do list um, because farmer's markets really should not be in the middle of the tax thing other than to make sure that you are paying your tax and that you're aware that you have to pay sales tax and that you have applied for a sales and use tax number. So that's why we require it. Thank you. Um, a question that comes up every year, multiple times to me is regarding the sales tax. And I will reiterate what you said that your sales tax is payable based on where the sale is made, not where you live. I also will reiterate that the Williamsburg may not require a vendor permit. If you are um, in that community, many others do, including everyone in Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield, et cetera. So depending on what market you are going to be in or where you're going to run your business, check with your locale because you probably are going to need a local business license and or permit to operate there. Um, Tracy, I have several other questions. As mm -hmm. always, you are doing fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, can you provide information on what you see are shortages of particular products at market? Sure. Cheese. Please give me some cheese. I know. Yeah. yeah. You sell it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I want the cheese. You bring me the cheese, I will sell you cheese. Um, yeah, dairy is really, really hurt in the state of Virginia. Um, um, other than that, it's really the special, like the more specialized you can make your product, the more likely it is um, that you can find a little space for yourself. And then look for markets that are just starting out or um, so like the more established markets like Williamsburg, we have um, we have produce vendors, but if you wanted to sell produce, you better submit an application anyway, because we will never consider a vendor who sells anything if we have not received their application. Because other until we get that application, it is just us imagining they wanna be part of us. Um, that application process is what we use. And then if we have a need that arises, we go to our applications that have been submitted for the past five years before we look elsewhere. 
Um, so, and we do not charge the other thing when you're doing your research is see if they have an application fee. A lot of markets only charge an application fee upon acceptance, at least our market. So you will not, so you can apply and you will only have to pay that $35 uh, market fee if you're accepted. And then that's a one-time application fee for us. We waive it every additional year that you participate, as long as you get your application to us in time complete. Tracy, one of the things, one of the trends that I saw come out of COVID was producers banding together and making theme products. So for $25, you can buy a breakfast basket or a produce box or dinner, and you would have your dairy, your, your milk, your eggs, your sausage, your bread. Did you do this at your market? Have you seen this? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, we always encourage our vendors to work together if and when they can. I, Elizabeth did something really cool at the end of last year where she worked. Um, so she sells specialty mushrooms, uh, including some that are heavily regulated like chaga and um, I think lion's mane. And she partnered up with our chocolate vendor to create lion's mane and chaga chocolates. So you get all the health benefits and you also get the sweet. So it's sort of like Mary Poppins, everybody's happy. <laughs> Spoonful of sugar, right. chocolate makes everything taste better. Um, but I thought it was a really neat collaboration. It is a single product though, but we really do like to see those baskets. Um, I see there was a question about online things and the cool right. thing about online things is it naturally creates collaboration, but the customer drives that. So they pick all their separate ingredients, we are getting ready to work with the, um, our local heart safe um, as Williamsburg is a de de designated heart safe community. Um, they wanted to do something for February being heart awareness month. And so we will be custom creating meal kits for our online pickup um, with heart healthy recipes from our local hospital doctors, um, which is something we have the ability to do because we have an online market. Um, but yes, we think that, you know, those baskets, we actually only allow our vendors to sell stuff that isn't made by them if it is in the form of a basket. So if you are an oyster vendor and you also want to sell oyster knives, which is you should, and mm -hmm. gloves, because mm -hmm. who has those, mm -hmm. um, then you would do it in a kit. So it would be like a dozen oysters plus the knife plus the glove. But you couldn't just sell the knife or the glove. You have to sell it together. And that type of stuff is just a really create. We also don't allow our vendors to sell t-shirts or bags or whatever unless they're selling it in a basket or something like that. So it helps keep our farmer's market look very traditional as far as farmer's markets go. But it also allows our vendors to add some of their creative stuff that they would like to add. I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the drive through markets. I know um, in March of last year, my commitment with the governor to get us all open was that we would go to drive through with curbside pickup and markets had to pivot and be flexible very fast. And folks looked at a variety of different types of online platforms. I will say as the executive director of the Farmers Market Association, in my opinion, drive throughs and online markets were an unequivocal success to the point where most of the markets, especially with online, have continued and almost become a year round market now. Um, and, and they've taken a lot of different forms. Can you talk, you had a very different model, a very specific model based on your community and your parameters. And it was just phenomenal what you were able to do to provide food and to get it to those that were shut in and underserved and underrepresented communities, the delivery mechanisms that you used, and then you reaching out to UPS and you know all of the different things that you were able to put together in order to get food to your community when the community of Williamsburg wouldn't necessarily let you have a traditional farmer's market early in COVID. Would you mind talking to that just a little bit Sure. I still have nightmares. <laughs> it's inspiring, Tracy, what you did, truly. It, I want you yeah, to share I the mean, story. 
It, it would definitely is a win in the overall farmer's market, uh, COVID, whatever. It was really, um, it definitely took a toll though. So we are not doing what we did, but I will briefly talk about um, what we did and then what we learned from it and what we're doing this year, if that's okay. Um, so in March, we started our season. We were ridiculously happy. Um, the first week of March when we opened, we thought it was gonna be our best season yet. Um, and the very next week we were closed um, and remained closed through June 27th. Um, and at that same time, because I have such a great relationship with so many of my vendors, I was definitely getting texts and phone calls saying, I'm gonna lose my business, I'm gonna lose my house. Yeah. Uh, like I definitely that kind of stuff gets personalized because the people at the farmer's market on Saturday, I spend more time with them on Saturday than I do my own family. And uh, 43 Saturdays a year adds up to a whole lot of time I'm spending. Um, we decided we needed to do something. We had already wanted to do an online um, pre-order or something system, but we didn't know what it was gonna look like. Um, we had already talked to a couple different businesses. And so a lot of the investigative research had already been done. Um, but then, you know, I also have a really amazing relationship with Fafma and Kim specifically. And I think it was just an off the cuff kind of thing. I was talking to Kim and then Kim was like, Hey, I heard from this lady. I've never heard from her before. Maybe you should reach out. She might be perfect. And her name was Rosemary O'Neill. And I have to say that she definitely really the hero in all of the COVID stuff for me and my market and now countless other markets who have, who have used her. Um, she was very small and it was definitely a little bit of a risk on our end to go with such a small new uh, software or platform developer. Um, but her platform is called Woso. Um, which stands for Westover, I think, which is where she was originally mm -hmm. out of. And I think the first market that she dealt with was the Westover Farmers Market. Um, mm -hmm. But we worked together to very quickly get um, all, uh, I think, 30 of our vendors online. Um, we took all of their products and um, put as many photos of those products up as we could. And the rest of them, we used generic little uh, graphics we had already created. We took all of the labels that we could get a hold of and we put all of the labels over um, onto their uh, products so that people would know what the ingredients were. Um, and then, you know, pretty much we were ready to launch. We launched with I think nine vendors. And at the end of it, we had 32 vendors. Our first week we had 38 sales and our second week we had 297 or individual orders. Now those orders, the cool thing about Woso Moso is it is a true marketplace, which means that when a customer pays, the money automatically gets distributed directly to the vendor so it wasn't on the market or the market staff to then have to individually pay each vendor for all orders. So customers go and they order and they pay their, I don't know. I think the average order was around $89. They pay their $89 um, and it distributed automatically. And then um, we didn't have any fees um, at the beginning, we didn't have any fees for the vendors other than credit card processing. We had zero fees for our customers. Um, our second week, we um, added uh, delivery. We had no fees for delivery. Um, and we were just trying to do whatever we could do to make some sales and make some money. I think our highest week, we had $42,000 in sales. Um, we did me and my team, uh, I have three paid staff people who worked with me over the, the winter to sort of make it happen. Um, and then we had delivery drivers who were out of work, restaurant workers, um, and we paid them to deliver for us. 
we partnered uh, with our local community center. They gave us a big space to use. At first we used this little restaurant and it was a nightmare. Like it just wasn't enough space. <laughs> Um, one of the things that we were dealing with then that we're not dealing with now is then at the beginning of COVID, if you remember, you could not have more than 10 people in a room. And some businesses made it that you could not have 10 people in an entire building. And that was the problem that we had with our huge facility. We had a great big building, but we weren't allowed to have more than 10 people. So we would start at seven in the morning and we would have our vendors and they would walk their stuff in and then they would walk out and they would just drop it off. And then we would have volunteers and they would organize the orders and we would work from seven in the morning until eight or nine o'clock at night every week from March through the end of June. Um, and it definitely took a toll on all of us. So um, when we were thinking about what to do at the end of the season, we, we definitely had some plans we had to make, like one, what was going to happen with the pandemic? Nobody had the answer to that. So normally we would have our first market in February, and then we would resume weekly markets in March. But because all of the unknowns and because of the you know scariness of last year, um, we decided that we would do a winter pickup, but it would be a drive through style from January through March, and we wouldn't resume our regular market until April. Um, and so, you know, there's some definite pit, pitfalls there. Like a lot of people are mad that they don't get their Valentine's Day market. And it actually this year would be a pretty good year to have a Saturday market because it's on the 13th. And like last year, I think it was on like the third, I don't know, it was, it doesn't always work out as perfectly as it does this year. But now that we know what we know about the vaccine and all that stuff, it's actually, I'm really relieved that I don't have to deal with an in-person market until April. So the way that our online pre-ordering winter pickup is working, which is different than last year, is the order platform is the same, except for we now have a whole year of making it perfect. Um, and figuring out a lot of things. So we have the order platform ready and we have um, trained all of our vendors on how to use it. And we've trained our customers on how to use it. And the thing that we changed was in the delivery mechanism. So we have this gigantic parking lot. My office is at Parks and Rec um, at the uh, Quarter Path Park and Rec Center which is in here in Williamsburg. And they have this gigantic parking lot. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. Um, and so we have all of our vendors spread way out in this parking lot. Customers come, they tell us their name, we hand them a receipt. We put a receipt on the clipboard and we put it in their trunk. And then they drive around to all of the very clearly marked vendors who are still sitting in their warm, cozy little cars. And they drive around through and um, so then they, uh, they drive around through at the end, somebody checks them out, make sure they have everything they need. If they need to be issued a refund, we personally speak to them, apologize, make sure the customer service is there, and then they move along their way. Um, and so it's reduced our time. We actually have decided to streamline it. It'll now just be one hour. Pickup will be one hour. Uh, we have a William & Mary student who is going to be doing the pickup for us for William & Mary students because transportation is an issue. Um, so she will actually be picking up all the William & Mary students orders uh, by driving through and then she'll drive them over to campus and have them on a table. We've worked with our uh, William & Mary partners to make sure that she has a warm little room that she can wait in. Um, and so she'll handle that for us, which will allow us to um, help our college students. Uh, we started um, we started accepting SNAP this season. Now we had a whole time to figure out all the quirks. Uh, so our EBT customers are now paying when they come to pick up and that's working amazing. Um, and we're getting ready to launch a, uh, um, a gift certificate discount program with our local radio station. So they'll be able to buy a gift certificate for $10, but they'll only pay seven. Um, the rest goes for us for marketing uh, at the radio station. And um, then they'll be able to use that $10 gift certificate on our online 
um, platform. So it's something new we're trying. We'll also be doing most likely delivery. Um, we will be doing delivery using a third party contractor. So basically all of our delivery drivers will be independent um, consultants. And so when they arrive, they will get their route. Their route will have a list of names. They'll drive through our parking lot and pick up the orders for everybody on their list. And then they'll pull over, organize their or orders and they will, um, they will go ahead and um, you know, do the same thing every other individual customer does except for they'll deliver it for us. And this year we won't be doing that for free. We will charge a delivery fee, which will pay for our independent contractors and everybody will be happy, hopefully. <laughs> There's still a couple of things we have to figure out, but that's basically the way that it will work. And so far uh, we have um, uh, 15 vendors who are participating, which is pretty good for the winter time. And we are averaging about a $98 average order. Um, and we are right at 55 customers a week. And we are three weeks in. So we haven't done any advertising. Students just came back to campus this week. So we're launching our William & Mary thing next week. And um, so we've got lots of time and lots of room to grow. And I think I saw some more questions pop yeah. in. Sorry, I was muted. A couple of other questions for you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about the online platforms and the different platforms that are out there, how you get your vendors on. Mm -hmm. I know that, um, again, as the farmer's market, is whatever, the head of this association, <laughs> what I saw, I know, what I saw and this is generalization, but what I saw and what I experienced personally as a consumer and shopper, a very good consumer and a very good shopper of farmer's markets, is that the markets that got online early and stayed online, as well as had, as well as in addition to being online, had an in-person presence when they were able to, but kept it small and tight and very safe, they blew it out of the water. They did very, very well. Markets and producers told me across the board, a lot of them had the best seasons they've ever had. Some of them went so far as to say that they did you know, four and five times the volume that they've done before. The markets that waited until June to get open, even if it was online, did not do as well because the producers hopped on board with those that got open in March and were selling. And if y'all remember last March, you know, nobody wanted to go in Walmart and Sam's Club and Kroger and Costco in order to buy food because, first of all, there were supply chain shortages, supply chain shortages, as well as the grocery stores and the big box stores were chaos. They wanted to buy local and safe, and we were tight and we continue to be tight with how we operate with safety mechanisms. And so the online platform and the online sales were very successful and consumers liked it. The markets that did not use an online platform where the markets handled it, where they let the vendors themselves handle however the orders were going to be. So, for example, there's a market that has 150 vendors and they let, consume, they let each vendor take their own orders and they were not capable of doing that. The vendors were totally overwhelmed, getting texts, getting emails, getting phone calls. And I personally tried to buy from this one market on three separate occasions and never had food from this market because the vendors just literally couldn't handle the overload. Whereas if I as a consumer went into my online platform and I ordered across the board from, this, from Williamsburg Farmer's Market and then I drove down and picked it up, then I got all my food. Could you talk a little bit about the online platforms. I know you did a lot of research in all of them that are out there and what you saw from yourself as well as your cohorts around the state as to what was the most successful for producers and vendors on how to get sales during this time. Because we're still under the same restrictions here in Virginia. So would you mind talking about that just, just a bit? Sure. So, um, I, and I definitely, a lot of market managers call me to, for yeah. this thing too. Um, so from a market manager standpoint, it's different than from a vendor standpoint. 
So if you're already in markets and 90% of your markets use Lulu's local food platform, then you would want every other market you participate with to use Lulu's local food too, because then you do all your inventory and pictures and stuff like that once and you're done. Um, so the choice I made to go with a different platform was not always super popular with all of my vendors. Although I will say that the, really the largest person who was upset with me was Elizabeth Haas. And you can see she actually really isn't upset anymore. She was just upset at first because it was new and it was scary and everything was new and scary. And it's a whole lot. Um, so there's, we use Woso, um, which is uh, wososomoso.com. And then um, the great thing is Rosemary will actually, she's the developer, Rosemary O'Neill. She will actually let any farmer's market vendor that works with Williamsburg or other, um, other markets that she uh, helps with, she'll set them up their own page. So uh, for example, Dora um, Feltran, who was supposed to be on the call, um, I know she's in Nor Norfolk right now. Um, she uh, participates in like five or six different markets and not all of them uh, were doing online markets. A lot of them did make vendors do it on their own. And so she, I think she was one of the first that was like, hey, Rosemary, can you just help me? And Rosemary was like, sure, I'll set you up your own page. Bam, it's done. So, um, so for her, she not only got to participate with Williamsburg, but because Williamsburg had a relationship with a platform developer, she got her own platform. She still uses it. There's also Squarespace. So if you're already using um, Square, you can set up Squarespace. It's pretty easy. It's very user-friendly. Um, if you have somebody that is really technologically savvy, they can make it even better. <laughs> if you don't, it's still really easy and you can make it work for whatever you need. Um, there are uh, Lulu's local food. Most of the markets in the Richmond area use Lulu's and it is definitely the preeminent uh, software development platform in the state of Virginia. Um, but it is not a true marketplace, which means that you will get paid as frequently as the market manager wishes to pay you um, because it's all done through PayPal. Um, and other than that, there's, uh, there's several apps that are out there. Uh, we did not go with an app and I'm actually happy that we did not because an app may be an unintentional barrier because it requires you to download something onto your cell phone. So it's all in all the things that you think about. And when you're in the middle of a pandemic, that's not necessarily the best time to think about something new, but you have to do what you have to do. And then you learn from that. So I can say, I'm glad I didn't go with an app I was going to, because I thought um, that was the best choice in the middle of a pandemic. And I got really lucky that I met Rosemary. Um, but you, the, the truth is you have the time to do the research yourself. There isn't that same drive and desperation that there was a year ago. You should though be concerned if somebody is talking about upfront fees or what their fee structure is um, to make sure that that meets with your, um, your plan for your business because some of the fees can be uh, different markets charge different things. I know some of the markets who are utilizing Lulu's platform are charging, some aren't charging, some are charging a flat fee. So just make sure you understand what those fees are. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity out there. If I were to be a, a small business and I needed a platform and I wasn't involved with the Williamsburg farmers market, I would probably go with Squarespace if I were just starting out and I didn't have a market. If you already have a market, then you probably wanna use whatever your market is using. Um, and they should be able to connect you up with somebody who can help you do that. Thank you. Well, the good news is, is that we're going to do an entire workshop in this series on all the different online platforms. We're actually going to have Molly Harris with Lulu's. We're going to have Farm Spread, who does, it's a data market management system, but they also have moved to point of sale so that they um, do online sales. Also, we'll have local line and we'll see if we can get somebody from um, Square and uh, see if we can get Rosemary to also uh, come on board. If you could put the Rosso 
uh, link in the chat, that would be great. And we had one more question, and then if I missed any, y'all let me know. So the question is, so aside from cheese, what else are, do you see as a, a gaping hole in markets? What other products can vendors, what other products do farmers markets need besides um, cheese, dairy? Uh, so I think I mentioned specialty stuff. So I don't know, I'm, I'm looking on my list of people attending and I'm seeing empanadas. And I'm yeah. currently doing a whole 30, so I'm really mad. <laughs> now I want to stuff an empanada in my mouth. Yeah, I um, empanadas, I know. So definitely um, there's lots of, so it depends on how creative you want to be. It never hurts to call and ask a market manager what they need um, because they may not even know, but you could be like, I, uh, I've been in fancy, I've been, I went to culinary school, I went to the CIA in New York, and I have all this talent, and I want to put it to use, and I want to start my own business, what do you think might work? I mean, we may come up with something that works, like bagels. I would really, I personally love bagels. We don't have good New York bagels. I think bagels will be delicious. I would eat bagels when I'm not doing 30. Me too. <laughs> so, I mean, if you ask me, I could be like, yeah, we have a lot of things at our market. We used to want bread a lot. We found somebody and we kept asking for what we want. We found a really good bread person, which then led to a German lady who's also makes bread and hers is delicious too. So we have sourdough and we have German and we have cruffins and, um, but there's other things like there's a move towards prepared food like in a meal sort of format. So not like HelloFresh, but already made and it could just be reheated or it's mostly cooked like sous vide and then you just reheat the rest of it yourself. There's, especially in like Williamsburg where there's lots of um, people don't necessarily wanna cook but they definitely want to splurge on delicious food. Um, there's definitely a need for some more of that, but it has to be the right person who has the right plan. And every so often, I remember when I first came on board in 2011, we had a caterer that worked with us that was trying to do that. And, you know, you have to make sure you have the money to make your dream come true. And if you're just struggling, it might, it, I mean, there's less barriers at a farmer's market, but you still have to have a plan and you have to stick it out long enough to make sure that, you know, you know it's really going to work or it's not going to work and there's a lot of reasons why things succeed and fail at farmers markets attendance is a big one so if you only have time to come once a month it and then you want to do something really specialized it's going to be hard to develop your business base because they won't be able to count that, that you're going to be there when they are there um so there's um like we would love to have ginger and lemongrass and um artichokes again i mean i know i'm from california so i love artichokes i know that it's not a Virginia thing but it should be <laughs> and then anything else like so you love satsumas i really love satsumas i wish somebody would figure out a way to grow them in virginia because they're my favorite um and supposedly they maybe could grow <laughs> yeah. but you know those type of things like being creative and figuring out something that you can do that solves a problem um that is how you're really going to be successful in any business, but especially in the farmer's market business. But those type of things. And then cheese, because we still really need cheese. We do. We need cheese. Um, are there any other questions for that Tracy can answer for you at this time? All right, well, I'd like to thank you. Um, Molly Harris with Lulu's actually is, uh, she jumped on the call a little while ago and she's put her contact information in if anybody would like to talk to her about Lulu's. Um, and as I said, she will be presenting at one of our upcoming sessions. We do have the dates for the upcoming sessions and I have put those into the chat box. Um, our next one will be on, they're all on Thursday afternoon from one to three. The first one will be February 11th. The next one will be February 25th. And then the last one will be March 11th. Our topics will be, and I'm not sure which is which, I have to line the speakers up, so I apologize. But we will be doing food safety. We will be doing, I will have a VDAX and um, Virginia Tech uh, doing food safety requirements for producers at farmer's markets What and VDH, what are the requirements, et cetera. If you wanna be a producer at a farmer's market or you wanna sell your stuff, 
retail. Um, we will be doing online platforms for um, data management, vendor placement, et cetera, as well as point of sales. And then our third will be marketing and social media in the 21st century, how to market your business. So um, I will now, I will say thank you very much to Tracy. If nobody else has any questions and I'll turn it back over to Michael. Hey, Kim, it does look like there was a question about something like maybe a young market turning into an older market. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I missed it. Yeah. Um, do you see that? The question, all right, hold on. How are we making markets to the 15 to 25 year old market? Right. And would you think of other vendors? Um, at your market, yeah. So how do you how do we move the new markets to be a sustaining market? Because out of the 356 plus that we have, some of them, you know, don't last. They're folks that just want to monetize the parking lot, and then some of them are all about food access for their communities. So, what do you think the success? What do you what would your tips be for success of running one of the state sure. the state and country's oldest farmer's market. <laughs> I think you're the only one that's actually written into the, uh, yeah, into the uh, constitution, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, so when we started out, I like to tell this story because it, it helps remember our original founders who are no longer with us. But originally our market was just an idea of two amazing Toms. Uh, Tom Power and Tom Austin of the cheese shop and of Barrett Seafood Restaurant. And they had this dream that they wanted a farmer's market that was like a European style market. And then they started talking to people. And from there, that talk turned into research. So I'm going to say research again. Uh, it's like my favorite thing. <laughs> um, so they reached out to the city of Williamsburg, who reached out to Colonial Williamsburg, who reached out to Merchant Square, who reached out to the William and Mary, who reached out to the Land Conservancy. Um, and there's probably more people that I'm forgetting that they reached out to. Um, oh, and then they also reached out to American Farmland Trust way back in the day. Um, and American Farmland Trust was the um, nonprofit that originally started the DuPont Circle Market and what is now known as, um, what is it now known as? Did its name change? It did. Oh, DuPont? No, it's still, well, DuPont. But the Market. Drinking Markets is now called. Pardon? Um, what is it called? I didn't hear your question. Uh, the group of markets that include. Fresh Farm. Thank you. Sorry, I knew it was something That's like right. that. That's right. The third um, largest, the third largest farmers market in the country, farmers right. market organization. Yeah. So, um, so we brought in those experts, uh, two lovely ladies, Anne and Bernie, and um, they came and they talked to the person that uh, that group of people had decided would be the farmers market manager when it launched. And they asked them the same questions you're asking me. How do we make a farmer's market successful? And they told us their best practices. And that has changed a little bit in their, like the new fresh farm probably has a different list of things. But originally those same things they told us then are still what we use as our guiding principles, which is you have to have a good blend of vendors. You have to have strong, you have to have strong anchor vendors. So you have to have the produce. Um, and um, other than that, you have to have a good location. And there are some other things. You have to have a set season. Um, and then your vendors have to participate more frequently. Like you have to get them to participate as close to 100% of their season as you can. And so all of those things we sort of took to heart and we still have a blend, the blend that they recommended, uh, which we don't like, it's not black and white and we don't hard and fast follow it, but it's something like 65% of uh, producers, which are growers, and then a certain amount, I think it's 15% uh, food and 15% um, of other category. I don't, I, I can send a link to our document with our original blend. Um, but we have stayed pretty true to our original 
idea. We also have a really strong mission. We have a very strong board of directors. We still have those vendors who joined on with us uh, so long ago. The majority of them are still with us. Um, and I was really hoping that Amy could be on this call because she could probably tell you um, one of the reason, you know, part of the reason we're successful. The other thing is from the very first day we opened, we had a full-time paid market manager. And that really helps because it is my whole entire job to make sure that the farmer's market is successful. And that really relies on making sure that the vendors are successful. Um, and then, you know, I bring in assistants who have skill sets that I don't have, um, and that really adds to it. So um, I think hopefully to answer your question, um, the way to make a one to three or one to five year old market into a 20 to 25 year old market is to do whatever you can do to get your market manager paid. And then to get whatever you can do to make sure that your vendors realize that they are a critical and crucial part of your market and that they should not leave you to go to the next market that just started up that may have a cooler Canva or put a for promotional thing. Like you need to keep your vendors as long as you can and then really promote and highlight those vendors who have been with you for more than one year. I think that it's telling that three of the top 10 farmers markets in the country are based here in Virginia. And their markets that, and yours is one, of course, and their markets that have longevity, have vendors that are loyal to them, have strong trainings for the producers, the vendors, have protocols in place, have great communication. You do farm visits and visit and check out all of the products. You test all of the products before you bring them into market. Um, farmers markets are a professional business here in Virginia. As you all know, um, Agriculture is the largest private industry in Virginia. It's a $80 billion industry. And with over 356 plus farmers markets and over 20,000 vendors, producers, et cetera, that are part of all of those markets, it's real. It's a real business when you're talking about those kinds of numbers, when you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars worth of revenue generated at the state level through farmers markets it's a professional business and it's our goal as an association and, and how markets get to be 25 year old is they treat their business like a professional organization. And that starts with paying their staff to treat it like a real business. So, um, so any other questions for Tracy while we have her? I know she's gonna provide us with the uh, website for the online platform that she's been talking about with the crazy name Roso. And um, I'm, did I miss any questions? Y'all feel free to speak up and I'm gonna turn it back to Michael. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, great conversation, uh, great information shared. Um, as Kim stated, our next uh, workshop will be on February 11th at one o'clock again. Uh, if you can take a moment uh, to fill out the evaluation in the link, I'll provide it in the chat. Uh, that's always a great help. Uh, those evaluations help us to provide more programming and workshops for you, uh, knowing that these are effective and that you're appreciating them. Uh, gives us the information to know that we need to do more of these. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, have a great day and a great growing season. And we look forward to seeing you February 11th. Thank you. Tracy will forward the presentation to um, us and Michael will be able to put that up on y'all's YouTube page so you have access to the PowerPoint presentation and the resources also. Thank exactly. you all. And in, uh, in about two weeks, the uh, two to three weeks, this presentation will be online as well on our YouTube page, uh, BSU College of Agriculture YouTube page. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Michael, for facilitating this.